You may have heard of a video game concept known as Nintendo Polish. The idea that the reason that all of those family-friendly games remain beloved by critics and fans alike is the attention to details that few would bother considering an integral part of the game. That's how this single Japanese company has held its own for decades on end as a standalone giant in an incredibly competitive and oversaturated world of video games, by caring about the things that we wouldn't even know we were missing as players. Consider for a moment a game hailed as one of the greatest of all time, The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. And think closely on the great things Nintendo included in this powerhouse of a title. There's a lot about this game that could be easily overlooked or dismissed as huge improvements to games both over time and as a general concept of improvements within a series. Even little additions to the gameplay, like light levels being more than just on or off, or the ability for Link to pick up and throw items, allowing for brand new styles of puzzles as well as the extra form of long-range combat when you're low on health or magic. So let's take a look at a few more of these terrific aspects of game design as we discover what's so great about The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. Nintendo certainly felt the need to add a little pizzazz to their signature fantasy adventure, and I think it's very fitting. This is a magic adventure in a far-off realm, and Link's first appearance on the NES didn't quite cut it in terms of pomp and circumstance. Right as you boot up this new game, however, you're greeted by the shining, spinning, incredibly bright Triforce as could only be displayed with the power of the Super Nintendo. And the game still has an opening sequence to clear up the story. However, this time there's no big list of items, and you're not sure what sort of tools will help you on this adventure. The whole Legend of Zelda series is about discovery, but the way things are explained to players has always had to change with the technology at hand. Back in the original Legend of Zelda, as with most games on the NES, developers had to be a little more obvious when conveying to their players what that 8 pixel tall item was. With the additional graphic capabilities of the Super Nintendo, things could be left a little more vague in purpose because you could tell at least what the item was by design and make some assumptions about what it might do. Supposing the game doesn't outright demonstrate for you what it's supposed to be used for. This can sometimes feel like a weird crutch in their design, for lack of a better term, but Nintendo games are often designed to be played by anyone and everyone as their first experience. Here's what I mean by this. Nintendo is a very wide-reaching company, and their games and consoles are seen as very family-friendly and fun for all ages. That means that every new generation of gamers on a new generation of consoles have to experience things for the first time, even if the things they're experiencing seem like common gaming tropes to the majority of us. Nintendo assumes that their most popular titles may be played by someone, no matter their age, that has never played a video game in their life. All of us had to start somewhere. That means that some kid's first video game at one point was, or is going to be, Pokemon Ruby, or Super Mario Odyssey, or just maybe, The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. And these games all have to be ready to reveal themselves to somebody whose way of viewing the world doesn't include the Tetris effect of solving video game puzzles in real world spaces. I mean, I have played a lot of video games in my life, and I've had friends that I've sat down beside to watch them play a video game for their first time, and my brain is baffled at the little things here and there that they miss. And they're the sorts of things that us longtime gamers have just become accustomed to. Like, yeah, of course you place a bomb on a cracked wall. Of course you fire an arrow into a switch that looks like an eyeball. But for new players, this is all new. And games like A Link to the Past format themselves very comfortably for any players, but definitely for newcomers to the series or to the world of gaming in general. Take, for instance, the fact that the light and dark worlds use the same layout. Obviously, this was done in part to save space, because they probably couldn't fit two completely unique, equally sized worlds on one cartridge in 1991. But in a user experience sense, this means that once the player reaches the dark world, they already know their way around, because they're familiar with the layout of the mirrored light world already. Voila! Nintendo just taught their players how to explore two worlds at once. Here's another small detail that is incredibly significant for those players who may not know what to look out for. If you don't pick up the lantern in your house before leaving at the beginning, then there are still two more chests with lanterns in them. That is, they only appear if you don't possess it already, otherwise they contain rupees. So let's take a look at how the beginning of the game is structured to guide all players, old and new, through a then-revolutionary new game that had a lot to demonstrate to anyone that controlled its hero. As your character wakes up, you're told where to go through Zelda's voice in your dreams. This provides obviously a little more guidance than in the first game, where you were dumped in front of a cave and had this feeling of being left to your own devices in an unknown world. 
Now, there's a little more sense of what to do first in order to kickstart your journey. In fact, if you stop moving for too long at the beginning, Zelda will chime back in to keep you on path towards the palace. As you wake up to this muggy, rainy world, one of the brightest objects you'll come across, of course, will be the chests you'll find along your way, starting with the one inside your house which holds your first of many pieces of equipment you'll collect throughout Hyrule. However, if you try and use your newly acquired lantern immediately, you'll be greeted by a message that tells you to watch your magic meter, so you know there's basically some new form of currency or power that you have not been exposed to yet. If you take a look at that bar in the top left corner of your screen, you may also see some new additions to the heads up display. You can see a row of items at the top of the screen, including rupees, bombs, and arrows, so you know that you'll acquire those at some point, but that you'll also have a more limited amount of arrows than before, just as you have to manage use of the lantern ability with the new magic meter, unlike the unlimited uses from the first game. It's a little weird that Nintendo introduced a relative to Link, only to have him killed off within 5 minutes of the game starting, but one excellent aspect that this structure provides is the fact that once he hands you the sword and shield that we just saw him walk off with moments ago, he mentions holding the B button to focus power in the blade. If you try doing this, while you're alone and focusing on how this sword works, you'll notice some great advancements in the attacking mechanics from the first Legend of Zelda, notably the fact that you no longer only stab, but you have a swiping, swinging motion, allowing for attack in an arc. You'll also notice that even though you're at full health, you don't shoot beams from your sword as you did in the first entry, so there's currently no way to blast enemies from a distance. By the way, here is something that's hard to notice because the game doesn't make a big deal out of it, but it is ever-present in the gameplay. That would be Link's left-handedness. Link being left-handed actually matters in terms of combat, and oddly enough, this is one of the only Zelda games in which that matters, because it means you need to keep enemies more to your left while fighting. Wind Waker has a tiny bit of this left heavy swinging, and in Breath of the Wild and Skyward Sword, he's right-handed altogether. But generally speaking, it never really applies to many of the Zelda games because Link either swings in a wide enough arc to negate his left-handedness, or you're using a targeting system to attack directly in front of you anyway. I enjoy, however, that in this simplified combat system, featuring a young man wielding a sword for what we can assume is his first time, that he leans a little more heavily to his dominant side, a feature of his character design that has for some reason often been made a significant point, but rarely expanded upon. Once you've rescued Zelda at the beginning of the game and you're done at the sanctuary, you'll step outside, that very familiar music begins, and you know that you're on your brand new adventure, and the world is waiting for you. It's nice to see a busy, bustling world as opposed to a land empty aside from monsters, but A Link to the Past is filled with all sorts of people with all sorts of stories. Rather than the few survivors hiding in caves trying to pass along sage words of wisdom or peddle you their wares, it feels like these people are just going about their lives, sharing gossip, giving advice, or trying to make a quick buck. It makes everything a little more cozy and natural to feel the world so alive with fellow people, whether in the middle of a town or off in a rural home on their own. As you wander through the country, you'll notice a lot of little things in the world that mean absolutely nothing to you as you begin, but grab your attention. And, as with so many of these early Nintendo adventures, it's easy to believe you'll be able to interact with these unknown objects later on in your experience. Map markers clarify where you need to head next in your journey without confusing riddles. You can say that the first Legend of Zelda had more unhindered exploration, but it was also very undefined. Sure, you could go wherever you like and try to find the next route in your adventure, but by the end of the day, you still have to figure out what it meant when that one lady in a random cave shouted, Meet the old man at the grave, or the eastmost peninsula is the secret. It's a little bit better for the flow of the game when you're just told, Here's where the village elder lives, go speak with him. You still get some of those vague messages, but they're really only vague in terms of your own understanding of the world. If you're told about the Waterfall of Wishing at the foot of the hills, then you can start getting a general idea of where to look, and you'll have to figure out where that is in context of the world on your own. Among these bits of rumors and guidance, you're told of the Master Sword, so you know it's out there. If you happen to be exploring the Lost Woods early on, you may even stumble across it, but just as with the upgrades to your sword in the first title, you aren't given specific information on how to take this sword with you. This is clarified, of course, by Sahasrila when you're sent on your mission to collect the pendants of courage, power, and wisdom scattered around Hyrule. This could make a player think, if you're going to get the Master Sword after these three pendants, then either how short is this game about to be, or what on earth could be waiting for you after you've collected the Sword of Evil's Bane? 
Well, once you access the Mirror World, and more specifically with the power of the Moon Orb, you realize this game has twice the exploration that appears on the surface, including areas and puzzles that don't even appear to be visible wandering around Hyrule. This is incredibly well paced because around the same time in the game, you'll, number one, collect the third pendant from the Tower of Hera, number two, gain access to the Master Sword, and number three, discover the existence of the Dark World. With all of these points in the game colliding in such a short time frame, that's when the player begins to understand the scope of the adventure laid out before them. Early dungeons have very plain rooms, but you may be obscured by a platform overhead. However, later dungeons have much more complicated layouts where even the doors and enemies can be hidden out of sight. You have to use your accumulated knowledge of how dungeons flow to smoothly navigate these new challenges. The changes to layouts in dungeons also make them feel a lot more realistic in a sense. Obviously, these rooms would be built to maximize space. It wouldn't just be 20 rooms laid out in the shape of a skull or a lizard. Since the dungeons aren't so specifically laid out in terms of which rooms you have to complete first, sometimes you don't even have to fight the enemies of a specific room to continue on your way. The dungeon map is a lot more detailed, of course, but also provides you with knowledge of multiple floors in the dungeon, giving you a better grasp of that newly added vertical axis and how it might affect your travel through and completion of the dungeon. The addition of a vertical axis of travel added a lot of depth, quite literally, to this game. This allows for more complex enemy interactions, such as enemies that can fly or jump over you, as well as more intricate puzzles and room layouts involving multiple floors. Near the beginning of the game, as you head to the castle to rescue Zelda, you'll even fall down the secret passage in the garden, demonstrating the fact that you may not even see some of these new layers of depth, and you'll just have to trust that they're there as you fall into a new area. The cracks added to the walls of both dungeons and the overworld do make things a little too obvious most of the time. But, as a comparison to the first Legend of Zelda, the hidden rooms in the overworld were not always necessary to explore, and more important than that, there were far fewer options in terms of hidden spaces on your dungeon map as well as possible spots on a wall to bomb at all. With those hidden rooms becoming a part of the entire overworld, and a much more substantial part of the entire game's experience, they had to give players a little extra push to make the game continue onward. If they really wanted to make it a more optional opportunity at finding that hole in the wall, Nintendo did occasionally change the size of the crack or couple it with darkness to make it less likely to be noticed the first time around while the player's mind is elsewhere. The use of the big key and big chest make it so much more exciting to obtain those important new upgrades and items within each dungeon, and you know immediately that whatever item you just obtained is almost certainly going to pertain to some aspect of this dungeon, whether involving puzzles, combat, or travel. The enemies of Hyrule have a little more personality than just charging at you now, such as the Stalfos jumping away from your blade. Not only can enemies move quickly, but they'll have attacks that can reach you outside of their immediate vicinity, and those moves are also fast. The Ball and Chain Trooper outside of Zelda's dungeon immediately demonstrates the parallel between the changes in combat Link has in this game, as well as what new abilities the enemies will have access to. In the first Legend of Zelda, enemies either hurt you by direct impact or by a few very uncommon ranged attacks like the Wiz Robe, which would still travel in a straight line, so you just had to move out of the way in time. But with these new additions to A Link to the Past, sure, you can strike in a sweeping motion now, but so can the enemies. The people and creatures living in this world, both enemies and NPCs, will also notice and respond to you in this game. This is a big step up from the mindless monsters of the first Legend of Zelda, where you just had to avoid them long enough to get a good few hits in. But A Link to the Past is sprinkled with thieves, soldiers, and monsters of all kinds that approach you in many various ways that all give them a little more personality. Nintendo did a great job differentiating which beings are inhabitants of the Light World and Dark World. The Light World inhabitants are either humans or generally more natural seeming creatures like crows, octoroks, and other creatures that feel as though they are the feral inhabitants of the world, including other semi-docile monsters like the Buzz Blobs. Then, in the Dark World, we have more definitively evil-looking monsters, like the Moblin and Henox. Even the birds in the Dark World look much more malicious than their Light World counterparts. This greatly defines the severity of your situation, traveling around the Dark World when it truly feels like a reflection of Ganon's soul. It feels as though Nintendo knew how excited players would be to experience this new entry in the Zelda franchise, and I think the developers themselves were equally excited to share a new story and experience. 
So much love and detail went into this game that demonstrates how highly Nintendo thought of it themselves. Even down to negligible aspects like the heads-up display. I mean, look at how big that item section of your inventory is now. Even as a blank void at the start, there's an exciting amount of extra space over the eight or so options you had before. I know this game is old news at this point, but we have to acknowledge what an absolutely ridiculous jump was made in world size and detail between the first Legend of Zelda and A Link to the Past. Not only is it not screen by screen anymore, but some of the individual dungeons feel as big as the original game's world. These days, even from console to console, it can be hard to notice how much different a game's layout really is other than talking about obvious changes to the world like topography and building layouts, but from one console to the next, this was a monstrous jump for Nintendo to make in terms of quality and depth. With a greatly expanded roster of characters, items, and other aspects that became staples of the Zelda franchise, I think it's plain to see what's so great about The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. Thank you all for joining us on this episode of What's So Great About Gaming, as we explored both worlds of The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. Make sure to tell us what you think about A Link to the Past, or even suggest a game for another video. If you want to hear what's great about another game, check out the link to our last episode, Spider-Man 2018, on screen or in the description. And please take the time to subscribe to be involved in the discussions here. Thanks again for watching, now go play a great game. We'll see you next time.